This episode is brought to you by Klaviyo, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Klaviyo, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Klaviyo. Learn more at klaviyo.com slash Spotify. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash Spotify. When someone accidentally threw away the school play costumes. Oh, no. Replacements were shipped with FedEx. And with picture proof of delivery, everyone could focus on the perfect opening night. FedEx, where now meets next. For residential delivery only. Welcome to the Our Official Intelligence Podcast with your host, Dr. Tony Huang. Today, I'm here with Moham Arif. Moham, can you give us a brief introduction on your background? Uh, hi, Tony. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm an engineer by education. I studied computer engineering, electrical engineering, computer science. I spent a little over 30 years working in the, what we call today machine learning and AI in an enterprise setting. Um, going back to the early 90s, I worked on some computer vision systems. And then I joined a company called HNC Software that was one of the first companies to commercialize uh, neural networks and used machine learning and AI for solving all sorts of problems across all sorts of industries. So that's how I got into it. So you've been in an industry for the last 30 years, is that correct? Correct, yeah. That's a long time. Did you see anything cool? Well, I've seen a lot of hype cycles. Uh, I've seen a lot of great breakthroughs, uh, things that just blow your mind, uh, especially when you have the background of where we started. Uh, so as I say, I started in the industry when just after we discovered that if you add a hidden layer, just one hidden layer in a neural network, you can do things that uh, you couldn't do before. And th there were so, there's a ton of uh, value created around that. A lot of interesting problems were solved at that point. And then over year, over the years, we've seen different techniques emerge and different breakthroughs. You know, the deep learning breakthroughs from 10 years ago, the language model breakthroughs from last year, and a whole bunch of other uh, things dealing with uh, technology that helps us do aspects of what human beings can do. So I'm curious, like, how did your interest in computer vision systems and neural networks begin? I started playing around with computers at an early age. And you get your interests take you in a variety of, uh, of directions. But I always gravitated toward, you know, hey, how can I make the computer do something interesting, be more like me in some aspect uh, versus, say, bookkeeping uh, or accounting or more transactional uh, things. And so it's really deeply interesting to think about how we think and whether we understand that enough to be able to teach a computer how to do the same thing. So what were some challenges that you faced in the early days of your career? Oh gosh, there was a, a lot that you had to learn to do uh, this sort of stuff. So you have to learn to program, uh, you have to learn, uh, of course, software engineering because programming in the large is different than programming in the small. You have to learn math in various flavors. You have to learn optimization, for example, trying to understand how to minimize or maximize some objective, which is at the core of most machine learning algorithms. You have to learn different types of machine learning models. You have to have exposure to various flavors of AI because it's not just one flavor. And so you have the symbolic flavor and learning about logic and programming languages like Lisp and Prolog. And of course, you have to learn data management because a lot of what drives machine learning and AI is data. And so how do you do data management? How do you bring in databases and, and other technologies to do all of that? And of course, you also have to learn systems programming because performance is so important in machine learning and AI. So being able to squeeze every ounce of it from the machine and from lots and lots of machines and from accelerators. And yeah, you have to learn a lot. So you've been there in, uh, during a period that's called the AI winter. For some of the viewers out there who are not familiar with that term, could you explain what that was and how it impacted the AI community? First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. 
This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. Yeah, so there have been multiple AI winters. So I'm not that old. I don't go back to the first AI winter. But the first meetings where people, where computer scientists got together and started talking about AI go back to the 50s. And I don't remember where the first meeting was exactly. It might have been Brown or Stanford or one of these universities. And people like Marvin Minsky and others came into town. And it was going to be a summer project to solve AI, Okay. And they made some progress. And of course, people started to think about, oh my gosh, computers are going to think and we're going to take over and expectations were set really high. And then of course, those expectations were not met. And there was a disillusionment and a disappointment. Again, I think in the 70s and 80s, there was a symbolic movement, the Japanese fifth generation project, the emergence of Prolog and Lisp, symbolic reasoning machines. You had Hardware systems like the Connection Machine, which was, I think, made by a company called Thinking Machines. And again, expectations were made super high. We're basically going to be an extinct uh, species soon. And uh, that never materialized. In the late 80s, early 90s, neural networks, again, emerged as being viable and hidden layers. And we can capture nonlinearities. And again, we started to read in mainstream press around that. So AI, these AI winter cycles are when people overhype it and then and people lose credibility and the funding gets cut off, uh, research is no longer cool. Uh, you basically, you feast or famine in terms of resources you have available to pursue. More recently, it's been still, we're still, AI gets a, a lot of hype, but um, we haven't dipped that low in terms of an AI winter. We've been making enough progress where we've avoided the winters, but people still make crazy claims about us going extinct in two years and stuff like that. Do so. you think that there's going to be a, like an AI winter following Gen AI and all this hype around it? I don't know if it'll be a, a full-on winter. I think it'll be in maybe a fall. <laughs> I do think that the generative AI was just so amazing and these language models were so interesting. And for the first time ever, we can build models that weren't just for a specific task. Up until this point, you wanted to detect fraud, you build a fraud model. You wanted to forecast future demand, you build a demand forecasting model. You wanted to, uh, I don't know, recognize uh, cats, uh, you build a cat uh, recognition model, right? So now these models, these amazing models are trained on everything we know, basically by crawling the internet and they can do, they can engage with you on any topic. So of course that was uh, eye-opening. And of course people started thinking again about are the machines gonna be bigger and smarter and better than us? Uh, but uh, I think we're coming off a little bit of the, the peak of the hype cycle and people are recalibrating and there's still a ton of work to do to make these language models work in practice for many problems. Some problems, they work great, especially creative domains and so on. But for domains where you need precision and you need accuracy and you can't, they can't just make up stuff like they do sometimes, we still have a ways to go. So you were, are you the founding member or is there a co-founder for the relational AI uh, company that, that? I'm the founder of relational AI. I've cool. been co-founder before and it has its advantages and I'm the sole founder of uh, relational AI, but I've been, I'm working with many people that I've worked with for 10 years or more, basically folks that I've known and we've had the same dream and the same mission over the years. But when I started relational, I, I, I did it by myself. So what was the main inspiration behind finding or founding relational AI back in 2017? So we had uh, a year prior, me and my friends and my colleagues, we had exited a company to a large enterprise software company. So we had a company called Logiplox and we sold it. And it was a nice financial uh, outcome for all of us, especially because we hadn't raised that much capital. And I thought, okay, maybe if I work at a bigger company for a while, I don't have to worry about payroll and all the, the stuff you have to worry about when you're uh, running a smaller company and I can focus on the technical work. Unfortunately, bigger companies come with their own distractions and, and, and so on. So after a year there, I left 
And uh, within a few weeks of me leaving, a lot of my colleagues, you know, that I value so much and worked with for so long, they also left. And I had this sort of knot in my stomach, like if we don't get something going again, I might not get to work with this team uh, again, because they'll all go to Google, Amazon, uh, Apple, Microsoft, and so on. And so just put up a little help wanted sign on LinkedIn and uh, put the band back together. And so that was a circumstance around it. The reason that the band wanted to come back together is because we'd never really realized our vision with our previous company. I wasn't in Silicon Valley at the time. We didn't have access to capital or expertise and so on. And we felt like what we're building really needs to exist. And I can't think of a better thing to work on. And, and I can't think of a better group of people to work with. So yeah, that's how we started. And I moved out to, to the West Coast. I live in, in Woodside now and got connected to some amazing people like uh, Bob Muglia and uh, Soma from Madrona and some amazing engineers and product people and scientists. And yeah, couldn't be happier. So how how have the goals and objectives of the company in the AI sector shifted from the early days um, to now? Yeah, most of my work before now has been around building specific intelligent applications, as they're called now. Okay, so I worked in the retail industry. We did supply chain management, revenue management, et cetera. I worked in the telecom industry. We built intelligent applications to help op simulate and optimize wireless networks worked in a, in a company that did credit card fraud detection and other kinds of fraud detection, okay? And historically, putting intelligence into an application was very difficult, very expensive. You needed whole companies to exist to build such an app uh, because no one company could afford to do that, okay? So you needed a company, you know, the companies that I was involved with went, were big enough to go public and have a lot of success and, and, and so on. And so over, you do that for 25 years, you're like, man, we don't have really the right platforms that combine data management with optimization, with machine learning, uh, with probabilistic modeling techniques, as well as symbolic modeling techniques. There's no one system that brings all this stuff together and makes it available to someone trying to improve decision-making, okay? So uh, I, I've been dreaming about being able to use a system like the one we're building at Relational AI, and I'm like, okay, let's, let's build it. And we had developed earlier versions of it prior because you had to simplify your lives, but we always had an application that we were selling. Today, we're just building infrastructure and we're positioning it as a co-processor to database systems like Snowflake because they're awesome at managing data and they have a lot of data, but they're not, they're the, the analogy here is they're the Intel CPU and we're the NVIDIA GPU. And together we can solve problems that we can't solve on our own. Over the past 30 years, you've witnessed several waves and some like shifts in perception in the AI industry. Like, how do you feel about like the understanding and acceptance of AI that has evolved over the decades? That's the funny thing about AI is at some point, these breakthroughs become so mainstream that we stop calling them AI. We were, uh, before we started, we were talking about Spotify and, and how we used to experience music, right? And then these recommendation systems became so good and they're just not part of how things work or maybe less well-known, but the world's supply chain uh, and logistics networks are run by these very sophisticated uh, mathematical optimizers, solvers that do linear programming and integer programming and, and really solve really hard combinatorial problems that you could have classified and you can still classify. Certainly where they were classified as AI, and their power and their magic, but now our world wouldn't work if we didn't have these things uh, driving the world, right? Or systems that verify correctness of hardware. Or, so there's a lot that we take for granted now because it's just, it's so common that we don't even label it AI anymore. You know? How do you see like generative AI impacting industries and what are some potential pitfalls that like organizations should be cautious about? Oh man, it's going to change so much. There's so much in the creative world that will change. You, we've already heard about lawsuits and people being very concerned about their livelihoods. If you're in any kind of creative business where you're writing text or drawing images or making videos or music or generative AI is all about generating new things. And uh, in the creative arts, it's okay to make mistakes, right? You don't have to say uh, perfectly correct things uh, all the time. So I think there's going to be disruption there. 
I think there are going to be some uh, disruption in certain professions. In the law, for example, there's a lot of document reading and, and, and summarizing and looking at various things in discovery and so on, accounting and auditing. There's a lot of document consumption and reading and so on. Just uh, so much that uh, I think can be disruptive in services industries where you, we require humans to interact with other humans and so on. It's sort of very labor intensive. A lot of interactions will be automated away and might become more pleasant in some ways. So there is going to be a ton of disruption. It can go, be, it can be for the good or for the worse. Historically, when new technologies have taken away road jobs and replaced them with more interesting jobs, maybe not always, but that's been the, the general trend. And I hope that will happen again here with, with generative AI. Yeah, I, I've noticed that in industries where there's been a labor shortage, that it's been replaced. They replace the labor shortage with some type of AI or generative AI solution. Like an example would be the, the most recent one was in hotels where there was a, a massive labor shortage and now they've replaced it all with like robotics and they just replaced like a customer service line with chatbots. So we're seeing industries that that are very hungover with the with this uh, labor shortage being re- having a solution in the AI field come in and come into that vacuum. So I'm actually very interested in your take on with concerns of about misuse of generative AIs, misinformation that has been popping up on the news. In 2024, there's going to be an election. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of misinformation that's going to appear next year. Also, there's like deep fakes. If you Google Nicolas Cage deep fake or like Tom Cruise deep fake, you can see that. Like how can the, how can like industry ensure uh, responsible and ethical use of generative AI with all these deep fakes roaming around. There's also uh, misinformation that's currently popping up and will pop up next year during the election year. What's your take yeah. on that? Yeah, for sure. And not just during election cycles, there's all sorts of fraud that can be committed. I have aging relatives and they can barely keep up with technology. And I can imagine all sorts of ways they can be uh, targeted through their devices, through phone calls, through emails, just um, uh, it's really concerning. And again, misinformation and all of that. I think this might sound, this might be too cute of an answer, but I think we're going to need Gen AI to help us, to help protect us from this Gen AI. I'd feel a lot better if my aging relative had some something in their device. So when they get an email telling them that uh, this is the IRS and they're behind on their tax payments and they need to pay, or yeah, like a the, Nigerian prince. Or a Nigerian <laughs> prince. Or there's so many different things that I've had to step in. Please don't give your credit card out <laughs> uh, to anyone. Like, please, it's not Microsoft who is never going to contact you and tell you to buy this virus protection. But yeah, we're going to need them with the same technology to defend us. And I think it can. I think it's sophisticated enough and can be trained well enough where at least it can caution us. And so we think twice uh, before engaging with fraudsters and uh, fake content. So with the explosion of data sources and data types, how would companies prioritize what data to focus on to maximize their return on investment for using AI? Oh man, I don't know how to prioritize. I know that it applies to all the data types. So we're working with clients and partners that are um, doing a lot of interesting stuff using language models on structured data. Certain companies we work with have hundreds of millions of columns of information in their relational systems, okay? Uh, A lot of that information is derived and computed from other bits of information in those systems, okay? So getting a handle on that and understanding what drives what and what's connected to what and, and so on, it's an amazing opportunity to tackle. Uh, also, we also have clients who who deal in a lot of documents, a lot of contracts, a lot of regulations, a lot of laws, a lot of just stuff in writing that before you just needed a human being to open a drawer, take out a document and, and read it or open up a PDF and read it. Uh, now you can actually automate the knowledge extraction uh, from that in, in, in a way that we couldn't imagine turning unstructured data into structured data that you can query or you can execute uh, and then, of course, less so in enterprise, but you have uh, many examples of um, images, uh, videos, uh, 
uh, audio, uh, but only slightly less so because there are so many businesses where you can capture information like this. Like at our company, we default to recording most Zooms now, right? And we ask the language model to summarize the meeting and people who couldn't be there or wanted to know if they should watch the recording or something can look at a summary and, and then decide. Yeah, so amazing what we can do now. So I'm curious as to your point of view on this, but I think that most companies are just sitting on data that they, they don't even realize is gold. Like, how would you like convince or help a company that their data is actually like worthwhile to investigate and like harness the intelligence from their data? Because every single company that, that I talk to, they're just sitting on mountains and mountains of point of sales data that they don't even think is valuable or call data that they don't even think is valuable. Like, how do you tell them that this is something that they should invest more energy into like extracting some intelligence from. This episode is brought to you by Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Want to advance your career or switch fields? An MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business can help. Earn your degree from a top-ranked business school with a thought-provoking curriculum, one-on-one -on -one leadership coaching, support from experienced career counselors, and full-time online hybrid and accelerated MBA formats. Join the intelligent future. Visit cmu.edu slash Tepper to learn more. Yeah, there's a little bit of, so certainly there, there exist data sets that are not that useful, okay? And of course, certainly there exist data sets that are extremely useful and un, 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 underutilized. So the problem is you don't know what's what a priori in many situations. And so you, a lot of people have to collect it. And I think the 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 price point around managing and analyzing larger data sets keeps going down. And I think if we can afford it, hold on to it, because as the technology improves, we can we will be able to do more to automatically analyze it and mine it and glean knowledge from it and do things that would be too expensive to do today because they would require too much human labor. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know about the data you have, and you don't know, even if it's not useful to you today, it might be useful to you in the future. And I, yeah, the, the trends are, as Tony, they're just towards just people accumulating more and more data as it becomes more affordable to do. In terms of regulation, like how should governments and international bodies approach AI in order to foster innovation or just to ensure public safety and trust in usage of, of AI? You know, I haven't thought too deeply about that. And there's a there's some complexity here because we live in a global setting and different countries have different regimes, right? Like data that we wouldn't think should be shareable and usable by someone's AI. In other countries, they might be mining every person's DNA data, for example, to try to develop capabilities that we wouldn't have. And, and the U.S. tends to be in the middle. Like I think in Europe, for example, they're much more careful about what uh, data can be used for what purpose. In other countries, they don't care. I haven't thought too deeply about it because there's a whole bunch of potential unintended consequences where if you regulate, over-regulate, and you stifle innovation, that means other societies can gain an advantage, other systems of living, other systems of government can develop stronger, better AIs and undermine the viability of the, of the societies that are over-regulated. The flip side of it is if you don't regulate at all, uh, it's the Wild West, and there are all sorts of horrible things that can happen as people this technology is put in the hands of people that will misuse it. And yeah, it's a little bit over my pay grade, to be honest. I, I think we're going to have to learn through a little bit of suffering as we go along. So if I needed to get in touch with you, how would I do it? Yeah, I would love to hear from you. So the best way to get in touch with me is to either link into me or check out relational.ai's website, www.relational.ai. So yeah, welcome any inbound interest from anybody. And then lastly, for anyone that's interested in the AI field and the professional services industry, do you have any like advice for newbies or people who just want to up their skill? Look, there's so much stuff out there that you that you can use to improve your knowledge and your learnings and so on. It, it is daunting. It might seem like a lot to learn, but find something you really enjoy doing and just find a thread to start pulling on. Any of those things I talked about earlier, either the math or the programming or 
the data management or whatever, and just just start spending time on it. I, I think it's really fascinating. I find it almost addictive. It's so interesting. And if you can get into a mode where it's you have a passion for it, that will allow you to work more and get better and better. Thanks so much for being on the show. And until next time, stay curious. Thanks, Tony.